Well, we have an exciting day today with our um, seniors lunch. I tried to work out this week. I think it's close to our 20th seniors lunch. Uh, this Very close. We're not too sure. We can't remember the exact date, but close. And uh, so it's really exciting that we have so many that are going to um, celebrate with us. But every generation, I don't know if you saw the photos from the kids Christmas neon extravaganza last week or the youth Christmas formal or every generation has just celebrated well and so we're excited that our women get to uh, celebrate on Thursday. So if you haven't put your name down, do that. Well, let's just pray. Father God, we thank you that we get to be together today. We thank you that uh, even as we ponder and we think about this Christmas season and just what you're doing in us, what you're doing through us. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. That's what we ask. And we ask that even as we leave here, we would know exactly how to apply and how to let your spirit work in us for the week forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our last uh, sermon for our series on Love Your Neighbor, I titled Um, my sermon today, What Does Jesus Want for Christmas? I don't know about you, but there's a point in every kid's life and maybe adult's life where they realize that Christmas isn't their birthday, but Christmas is when we celebrate Jesus' birthday. Don't get too hung up on whether the date's right. It's probably more like September. It doesn't matter. We don't celebrate the king and queen's birthday at their right dates either. So no one gets hung up about that. We're Australians. We're easygoing. No one cares. So, um, I mean, you may, and if you do, that's fine. But Let's not get hung up on that. Let's celebrate anyway. But there's a time when we realize that it's not our birthday, even though the gifts are given to us, but it's Jesus' birthday. Anyway, I, <laughs> I went to a website called Statistic Brain. It's not my normal kind of website I would go to, I have to tell you. But anyway, they tracked the must-have Christmas gifts for the past few decades. See if you recognize any of these. In 1983, everyone had to have, well... Everyone of female had to have a Cabbage Patch doll. This is the original vintage. Now they sell for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Because should have, I think I do have one in the cupboard somewhere. In 1985, we just had to have an $18 pound puppy. In 1989, American households scrambled, I think Australians too, to get a new Game Boy. That was the 80s. Can you believe it? All right, here's the 90s. Followed by 1995, the Beanie Baby craze and the 1996 Tickle Me Elmo that went viral. In the ensuing years, American consumers knocked themselves out to buy the following top yearly must-have Christmas gifts. 2000s, any guesses? Too late. A new iPod or a Wii? Um, In 2010, we were buying the original Kindles, the Angry Birds board game, the Doc McStuffins doll, And for every poor household that had a girl in it, the frozen Elsa sing-along doll. What is on your Christmas list this year? We have uh, three kids, and so now technology being the way it is, they have notes, and they send us a shared note with instructions on uh, different things. And then even grandpa's to buy this one, and you're to buy this one. Very specific. It's excellent. Did you know that 39% of shoppers will purchase a department store gift card for friends and family, followed by 33% of shoppers will think, oh, you know what, I'll just buy someone a restaurant gift card. Anyone prefer to buy gift cards so you don't have to think about gifts? Okay, well, here's the statistic, okay? The typical home has an average of $300 in unused or unredeemed gift cards in a drawer. These cards are often misplaced, accidentally thrown out, or only partially redeemed. Between 2005 and 2011, in the US, $41 billion worth of gift cards went unused. $41 billion. Well, giving is a big part of Christmas. Uh, My primary love languages are encouraging words and gifts. I love a meaningful and thoughtful gift, a gift that says, I know you, a gift that says, I love you, 
And a kind and a real card lets me know how someone feels. Someone who just writes, you know, I love it. I was a school teacher for many years. Two Mrs. Tabar love Jimmy. And I'd, I, I would often in my classroom go, can you take it back and write something with feeling um, on this card? And they'd go back and write, I had a good time in your class or whatever they wrote. I love words of encouragement. How about you? We have a friend who is an acts of service person and to show our love to them, we know it means we need to do practical things. It means we need to help out. It means we may need to mow a lawn or it means we need to cook something or help out with babysitting, whatever. That shows them we love you. Christian is a quality time person. I mean, he's low maintenance, but he does like quality time. So our Wednesday night date night that we guard Except for worship, when we're on worship team once a month, we come and we have date night here and then we grab a coffee or something on the way home. Every other Wednesday night, that's our time because his love language is quality time. And so that's time that I get to show him my affection and my love in just spending time. Well, and you know there's other ones, physical touch, there's all kinds of some people, they just love a hug, they love a handshake. All kinds of different ways that we can show love. But I think we can get trapped into thinking that there's only love between each other. And I think as Christians, we have been talking about, even in this series, that our job as believers, our commission as believers is firstly to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus would say the second commandment is like it. It seems totally different, but he says it seems like it, and that's to love our neighbor as ourself. And so that love that we show to each other is an expression of the Father's love to each other. But I was thinking about this. There are a lot of great people in our society, whether they're Christians or not, doing great things. Um, I was reading the paper this week. There's a lady who's uh, working in Coles, and she gives all her wages away. Her son passed away, and so she is giving all of her wages away uh, to charities, and she works for free. I mean, Coles pay her, but she gives it away, and she is giving her life away, not because she's a Christian, but because she's a good person. And there are people in our world doing great things. So what's the difference for you and for me? Why would then we go and do the things? Why would we go and take fruit boxes to people who we may never meet? Why, why would we do that? And David would say there is a cause. Simon Sinek, he wrote the book, Know Your Why. He would say that to do something effective, you need to know why you're doing it. And I want to suggest to you that the reason that we go and show love, the reason that we love our neighbor, the reason is Jesus. Not even complicated. He's the reason. He's the reason that you choose to speak nicely and not overreact. He's the reason why we give grace when we don't feel like it. He's, he's the reason. And you've seen it everywhere, haven't you? Jesus is the reason for the season. But what if it was more than just a slogan and it was actually the instruction to our hearts that he is the reason for the gifts. He is the reason for the celebration. He's the reason for the extra effort. And he's the reason for, you go ahead and fill in the blank. So if he's the reason, then there is no excuse in our community for any of these things. There is no Christian Grinches or Save Scrooges or Believing Bar Humbugs. They don't exist in our Christian world. Why? Because we have a reason. We have a reason to celebrate. We have a reason to be kind. We have a reason to hope. We have a reason for joy. We have a reason to love. We have a reason to give. And his name is Jesus. They shouldn't exist in our Christian world, in our believing hearts, but sadly, I think they do. And they do because we're human. The season brings up all kinds of different things for so many. Maybe it's loss or grief, disappointment, maybe just the fact that a carol is playing reminds you of things in childhood that were not easy and tough. And so it might bring up unmet expectations or financial issues or relational conflict or dread as you come towards Christmas and seeing family that maybe you haven't seen 
since this time last year. And we begin this inward focus on us and how we feel. And in doing so, we carry a Grinch spirit or a screwed spirit or a bah humbug spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. The spirit that we're meant to carry is one of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. And it only comes from the Spirit of God in us. And I think it comes because we've lost sight of what the season is all about. We've forgotten our why. It's all become about our preference and our convenience. So if we're going to focus on Jesus, what does he want for Christmas? What does Jesus want for Christmas? And I think as we've gone through this series, we see what he wants for Christmas. I think he wants all his kids to come home. I think for Christmas, if you went and asked the father what he wanted for Christmas, every parent that I know, more than the gifts, they want all their kids around the table. And some of you, that's why this season is hard because you know that all your kids won't be around the table, but you can understand why the father feels this way. He wants everyone to come home for Christmas. You know, John 3.16 says that it's God's desire that whosoever, that all would come. John 14 says that Jesus is preparing a place for us. And we often will read that at the end of someone's life, but I think probably we need to read it more at, in people's lives that Jesus has gone to the Father to prepare a place, to prepare a room for you and for me. Why? Because he's ready and waiting for all his kids to come home. When you have uh, people that are coming to your house, what do you do to prepare? You go, you make sure the guest room looks beautiful, you get the essential oils out, you make sure it looks, smells nice, looks nice, iron the sheets. You do all the things. Why? You're preparing. Why? For the ones you love to come home for Christmas. For the ones you love to come in. And that's exactly like the Father. My thought is this morning, how will they come? How will all his kids come home for Christmas? Jesus loved to tell the story about things that were lost. He talked about the lost coin. He talked about the lost son who deliberately left his home, said, stuff you to his dad. Left home, squandered his inheritance, ended up eating with the pigs, and somehow in the middle of that horrible situation had a realization, even the servants eat better like this than this in my, master's, in my father's home. I'm just going to go back, and I'll just tell him I'll live like a servant. Not knowing if he'd been accepted, if you read uh, the story of the prodigal son in the Gospel of Luke, and he comes back home to a father whose arms are open. He's ready to throw a party. He has been waiting for him to come home. The room's been prepared. He didn't go, you know when, I don't know about you, but when I left home, my mom, every time I'd go back home, she'd present me a new box of things that I'd left there that now I could take to my new home because I don't want it in my house anymore. Um, and, so, and soon enough, your room gets transformed. You thought that room would stay forever as your room in the house. But soon enough, that room, any parents had kids leave, that room becomes the sewing room or the music room or the reading room or some man cave that you'd hoped that you could have forever. And now the kids have left and you can do whatever you want in that room. This father was waiting. I believe the room was ready. He had left the room for his child to one day come home. And the father has a room empty for you and for me to come home to him. He hasn't gone and packed all your things in boxes and said, oh, well, if they don't want me, they're out. They can take it to their new... He hasn't done that at all. He is waiting for his kids to come home. Well, how will they know? How will they know to come home? They'll know because we'll tell them. They'll know because his other kids will say, hey, Jesus made a way, and he made a way so that you and I 
could come. And here's how we've been talking about it in this series. Pastor Ethan talked about it and Pastor Warren last week, that we will show up in people's lives and we'll show and give out with our, um, with our generosity. We'll show people before we even say a word. That's why we've taken the fruit boxes. We'll show them. We'll show them love. We'll show them kindness. Sending a text, checking in, showing up. And then there comes the tell. In, in the U.S., the kids will, they call it, um, in you know, infant school, they'll call it show and tell. In Australia, we call it news. Does anyone, any parent remember their kid coming home and saying, I have to do news this week? And they come up with some crazy thing or they take a bag full of all their trophies from the last 50 years and they drag it to school and they get up and every teacher groans and says, you can show one trophy. And the kid has a bag full of, um, and it's called show and tell. But what is it really? It's news. They're telling their news. And the funniest thing is when a kid comes and totally just makes up random stuff that you know is not true, and they come and just give random news about random things. Well, you know, in the scriptures, uh, if you go ahead and have a look um, at the beginning, if you look, it says the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke. That word gospel is the Greek word euangelion, and it means the good news. So what is it? When you get to the Gospel of Matthew, it's the good news according to Matthew. When you get to Mark, it's the good news according to Mark. When you get to Luke's Gospel, it's the good news according to Luke. Let me show you, let me show you this. A birthday announcement, this is a birthday announcement from a historical source called the Calendar of Priene. It's an old royal announcement from the Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar, and it uses the Greek word for gospel. Have we got it there? There we go. You don't have to read it all. But this is an announcement of Caesar's birthday. But if you read it and go through, it's, it says that um, Providence, they were calling her, had sent Caesar Augustus, sent him as a savior, both for us and the descendants, and how he would come and he would bring hope. And, uh, he, would, um, he would come and by his appearance, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leading to posterity any hope or surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of the good tidings to the world that came by reason of him. Do you, do you think, rem, look and see any words that remind you of the birth announcement of Jesus? This good news wasn't just a Christian, you know, or a religious or a Bible word. Euangelion was a part of everyday society and they would make these birth announcements. And that's why when you hear the birth announcement of the Savior, Jesus, you hear the angel. Good news of great joy for all people, not just Augustus's few or many, but for all people, for all time, that there would be a Savior and his name would be Christ the Lord and we would call him. I mean, this announcement is good news. So how, how will people come home for Christmas? You and I'll tell them the good news. We'll let them know, give them the birth announcement. The Savior's been born. You know what? I would be surprised if many even understand that you and I have conversations with what Christmas and Easter and some of even the celebrations that they celebrate, that they even understand beyond the religiosity of the terminology of what it really means. But what if you and I told them the story of Jesus, just like the gospel according to Matthew and the gospel according to Mark? What if Pastor Warren told the gospel according to Warren? And in it, it was all that Jesus had done in his life. It was from his point of view. It was to a specific target, to to a specific audience. But this gospel had the Jesus story woven in it that would come and bring life and hope to all. Oh, that you and I would all have a gospel story to tell. That you and I would all, in the gospel story, tell the gospel. That Jesus came to die, and he came and he rose again, that you and I might have eternal life through him. Romans 10, 14 to 15 puts it like this. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? 
That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring what? Good news. And what's good news? It's the gospel. It's the euangelion. The good news of Jesus. How will they hear unless someone tells them? 1 Peter 3.15 puts it a different way. It says this. It says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, listen, this is all you have to do. Always be ready to explain it. Can you hear that? So if someone asks you, be ready to explain it. Probably told this story before. I remember year 12, I was doing my HSC. I remember being in the library in East Hills Girls. That was my high school that I graduated at. And and it was nearing kind of middle of the year. I think it was nearing the trials. And my friend Christine walked in to the library. And she was very, very smart. You know, she's the type of girl that you sat around so that you could just, you know, glean some of her cleverness and she walked in and she was angry with me and she looked and she said I want to know why you're so calm I'm just in the library I made a very big scene and I remember I was 17 I remember looking at her and just saying Jesus because she was mad and I thought I need Jesus right now to come and intervene I just said Jesus it's the only reason every morning I get off a station early, and I walk all the way. I have my little scripture that I'm holding on to for my HSC, and I pray, and I trust God. And that's why. She said, well, I need his help, and you better tell me how I can get his help now. (laughs) No problem. Right there in that library, I led her to Jesus. To this day, some 20-something years later, I heard that she's still in church and still has a family. Don't you just see... I didn't have to do anything. I, we've been great friends. She'd been, she'd been a great friend to me. I'd been a great friend to her. It wasn't like it was just one-sided. But I had showed just who I was normal. I didn't pretend like I didn't go to church. I mean, I couldn't. We were here every night at those days. Um, I showed her with my life and then just answered this verse. When she came and said, why do you have this hope? I told her why. Honestly, that's it. That was a success story, but I can think of many times in my life where I have failed to tell the reason why. For all kinds of different reasons. But what if you and I determined that we weren't going to miss an opportunity just to give the reason why? Well, I think two things he wants for Christmas. The first one is he wants all his kids home. And I think the second thing he wants for Christmas is he wants affection and devotion from his kids. I mean, there's no point in your kids coming home and then they're mad that they're there. You know? Or there's no point in your kids coming home and they're at the table, but they're like, you know, there's no affection, there's no devotion, it's tense, it's ugh. No father that I know of wants that around his table. And your heavenly father's the same. He wants our affection and our devotion. There's a character in the Christmas story that we're going to look at. And I kept our big Bible passage to this section because I really want to focus in on that as we finish today. We're going to look at probably an unfamiliar character to some of you from the Christmas story and to many of you, just a refresher. But if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, And knowing that it was our seniors' lunch today, I thought it was really fitting to tell her story. This is Luke chapter 2 I'm reading in the NLT. Just to give you a bit of a recap, if you read Luke chapter 2, that's where you're going to find the story of the birth of Jesus. And so towards the end of the chapter, Jesus has been born. The shepherds and the angels have glory to God in the highest. They've announced him. And then... We read in verse 21, eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus and the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering and as required by the law of Moses, after the birth of a child, so his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice. Required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Verse 25, at that time, 
There was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. I love how this man is described. He was righteous and devout at this part and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and jo uh, Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the Lord required, Simeon was there. Don't miss that. Because he'd been eagerly awaiting, when Jesus arrives, he's there. So when Mary and Joseph, uh, Simeon was there, he took the child in his arms. You imagine this old man in the temple. And he takes the child in his arms. He praises God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. I mean, I'm thinking this poor chick, she's got a newborn baby, eight days old in the first century, and now she's being told the sword's going to pierce your soul. I mean, this is, this is heavy stuff for a mum. And here's the lady I want to introduce you to. Her name is Anna. Have a listen to her story. Anna, a prophet. So when someone tells you that there were no people who preached who were women in the New Testament, take them to Luke chapter 2. Anna, a prophet. A prophet talks in church. Anyway, a prophet was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she had lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshipping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph. So she's in her late 80s, or mid-80s. She'd been a widow... I mean, they got married in their early teens, so she'd been a widow, you do the math, 60-something years, maybe 70 years, long time. She had dedicated her life to the temple. You read into that and you go ahead and read your history books from the first century, that means she had no family who would look after her. She had no family who would feed her, clothe her, look after her. And so she became one of the widows in Jerusalem who the temple would look after. Come on, picture, picture her. And all of a sudden, Simeon walks in. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph and she began praising God. Shirley, I picture you like this. I picture you, I could imagine Jesus coming in and Simeon and all of a sudden you being in the temple and seeing Jesus and all of a sudden just praising God. I can just see it. And she begins to praise God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. So she was a prophetess. She was a daughter, your scripture tells you that she was from the tribe of Asher. Asher was considered one of the lost tribes of Israel because they'd been scattered during the exile. Others thought they didn't matter to God, they were scattered. He delights in using nobodies that people seem to forget. She was old. And age doesn't factor in at all. What factored in the years that she sat and waited only added to the beautiful mystery and the hope and the anticipation that she would one day meet her saviour. You know, our culture has this ageist thing happening where we look and think, you know, 
after a certain age don't even try to apply for a job. We have this thing that there are people of certain age that don't fit. I want to tell you that that's not the way of the kingdom. That's not how God thinks. Praise God, that's not how we here at Hope Point think. But God has designed a plan and a purpose for each one, for each different stage and season of their lives. My desire, just like this woman, Anna, is that I would be found in the center of his will until the very last. She was a widow. She'd been a widow for a really long time. But she had put her faith in God in action in two ways. How? In worship and then by telling everyone. She showed and she told. She did exactly what we talked about. How do, how do we let people know, hey, God wants you to come home for Christmas. This is how. She praised God. She gave him her affection and her devotion. And then what did she do? Here's what the scripture says. In case you think that women shouldn't talk about Jesus, this is what Anna did. She talked about the child just to the men. No, she talked about the child to everyone. Come on, read it. She talked to the child about everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God. She let them know, this Savior, Christ the Lord, He's arrived. He's come. I don't know about you, but when you finally get good news, you can't wait to tell everyone. There is nothing that can tain you. No religious thing, no tradition, no, nothing's going to stop you. When you get a bunch of good news, it's time to let the world know. And that's exactly what this lady did, who was of age, who had gone through a hard time, who was of the forgotten tribe, who didn't have family of her own to look after her. And now we know that she's been waiting and worshiping and praying and fasting and giving her life to God in worship and devotion. And then the Savior walks in the room. And as he walks in the room, she can't contain herself. She can't contain the praise that wells up within her and she can't contain her expression of that to let everyone know, Jesus has come. Tara Johnson wrote this beautiful blog on Anna and she composed it beautifully. I'm going to read it to you. It says, The vain hands that may never have held a child of her own were now trembling as the tiny fingers of the king and creator curled around hers. She'd witnessed death steal away her loved ones, but now beheld life cradled in the hands of an astonished Simeon. And I think somehow she knew those same dark eyes watching her with wonder had welcomed her husband into paradise with a smile. The same eyes that witnessed the stars being spun into existence, that watched Adam draw his first breath, could yet see the need within her own soul, how his somber gaze must have pierced her heart with wonder. She talked about the child to everyone she knew. She showed her love in praise and devotion. And then she just simply told the story to all those waiting for hope. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you turn on the news lately, there's a whole lot of bad news from every section of the globe. And how will they know the good news if you and I don't tell them? They're not, Channel 9's not getting on to tell them the good news. Channel 7, Channel 10, they might have a good news story, but you and I have the good news story that will bring hope, not just for one day, but for every day. John Maxwell says this, he says, you and I are the connecting link between people and Jesus. You and I are. Not someone else. You and I are the connecting link. Blaise Pascal, he was a mathematician, a philosopher. He said this. He said that there is a God-shaped void in every human heart that can only be filled with God himself. We try and fill it with everything else. Everything else. But that hole, that can only be filled by God if the musicians could come. In case you get stuck at this point, I think sometimes we freak out about how to tell the story. Well, how am I going to tell this story? 
So I'm going to just quickly put five different ways that you can begin to tell the story of Jesus. But on your way out, um, the Billy Graham organization have a great website called peacewithgod.net. Peacewithgod.net. And I have um, downloaded, it's a little track that you can put in your pocket. And it just really simply explains the Jesus story. And if you ever meet someone and you get a bit stumbled on how to explain the Jesus story, pull it out of your pocket. People just want you to be real and give a reason and give a reason for the hope that you have. You and I are just like everyone else. The difference is that we have a reason for the hope that we carry. Some of you will remember that to explain salvation, you might explain it using the Roman road and you can go and you can go and look at that online and just put in Roman road and salvation, Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. I mean, you can go and all the way down to Romans 10.9, when you confess your sin is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You can go and explain salvation with the Roman road. Or maybe some of you did, you know, counseling for the Billy Graham crusade. I remember when the Billy Graham crusade was here and we learned the two ways to live. And however way you know how to explain it, just keep it simple. And just start with you. What has Jesus done for you? What has Jesus done in your world? I'm going to read you this story from Max Licata's book, No Wonder They Call Him the Savior. And we're going to finish in prayer. Why don't you stand? Max tells a story of Maria and her daughter, Christina, that shows the heart of God. Longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood, Christina wanted to see the world. Discontent with a home having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin and a wood-burning stove, she dreamed of a better life in the city. One morning, she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart. Knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria hurriedly packed to go and find her. And on her way to the bus stop, she entered a drug store to get one last thing, pictures. She sat in the photo booth, closed the curtain, and spent all she could on pictures of herself. With her purse full of black and white photos, she boarded the next bus for Rio. Maria knew Christina had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. And when pride meets hunger, a human will do things that were before unthinkable. Knowing this, Maria began her search. Bars, hotels, nightclubs, any place with a reputation for street walkers or prostitutes. She went to them all, and at each place she left her picture, taped on a bathroom mirror, tacked to a hotel bulletin board, fastened to a corner booth. And on the back of each photo she wrote a note, if it wasn't too long before the money and the pictures ran out, And Maria had to go home. The weary mother wept as the bus began its long journey back to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the hotel stairs. Her young face was tired. Her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken. Her dream had become a nightmare. A thousand times over, she had longed to trade these countless beds for her secure pallet. Yet the little village was in too many ways too far away. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar face. She looked again, and there on the lobby mirror was a small picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned and her throat tightened as she walked across the room and removed the small photo. Written on the back was this compelling invitation. And I want you to hear this invitation this morning, because if you're far from Jesus this morning, then this invitation is the same. Her mother had written on the back, whatever you have done, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. She did. And our prayer is that you do and the ones you love do too. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you're a God of invitation. What a thought that the God of heaven 
would send Jesus with an invitation for us to come home. And we can get hung up on the things that we've done, the things we've said. We can get hung up on who we are and even the sin in our own lives. And forget that if it wasn't for your mercy, and if it wasn't for the grace that you've extended and the kindness that you show us, we would all be lost. And I pray, Lord God, today that the found in this room would see the lost around them and would be guides and directions that show them the way. Just like when we meet someone who's lost in the street and they have no idea how to get to the place they're going, all they need is someone to show them the way. Help us show the way well. Help us not to put people off by who we are. But help us to be light and hope that people will come and even just ask, what is it that makes you hopeful? Help us to show and tell, to tell the good news in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of this message, it would be remiss of me that if you were visiting here this morning and you'd say, Beck, if you knew my life and I would look you in the eye and tell you that Jesus already knows and he still got you in church this morning. He already knows. He knows every single part of it. And nothing can separate you from His love. Absolutely nothing. No place you've been. No action you've taken. Absolutely nothing can separate you from His love. And all He's asking in return is that you would come home and show Him affection and devotion. Yeah, there's stuff that once you get there, he'll help you clean up. I don't know about you, but when my kids come in, well, not anymore, but when they used to, all muddy and dirty. I'm their parent. I know how to clean them up to come into my house. They don't have to do it themselves. Actually, I'd much prefer it if I did it, because um, then they won't carry stuff all over my floor. As the parent, I'll clean them up. It's my job. You can't. You're just a kid. And so today, at the end of this service, there's an altar down here, and if you need to talk to someone and say, hey, I need to accept that invitation. I need to come to Jesus this Christmas. Then we would love to talk with you and lead you. Bless you, church. We're going to sing one more time.